Thank you so much for coming to New Canaan Library for this incredible event featuring three really outstanding authors. Before I continue, I want to introduce Fiona Davis, Susie Orman, yes, Susie Orman Schnall, and Julie Saitow. That's right. You're a very nice audience. I like you already. Tonight, we have Fiona Davis is going to be moderating this evening. And Fiona Davis is a New York Times bestselling author of historical fiction set in iconic New York City buildings, including The Spectacular, um, The Magnolia Palace, and The Lions of Fifth Avenue, and others. That's right, fan favorites, I can tell. She lives in New York City and is a graduate of Columbia Journalism School. Glad to have you here moderating tonight. Um, then we have Julie Saitow, award-winning author of The Plaza, The Secret Life of America's Most Famous Hotel, and newly published When Women Ran Fifth Avenue, Glamour and Power at the Dawn of American Fashion. She's a regular contributor to the New York Times, and her work has also um, appeared in the National Public Radio, Bloomberg Business Week, Travel and Leisure, and elsewhere. And then last but certainly not least, we have Susie Orman Schnall. Um, she's the author of five novels about ambitious women. We love that around here. Anna Bright is Hiding Something, We Came Here to Shine, The Subway Girls, The Balance Project, and On Grace. She's also a screenwriter, currently shopping her first pilot and feature-length screenplay. Maybe we'll hear about that this evening. I also do want to give a big thank you to our partner and good friend at Elm Street Books. That's Eve over there. <laughs> Eve and her team do an amazing job finding these authors, and I'm so glad that we can work together so frequently on these author events. Please help Eve um, and not ha make her carry all those boxes of books home. Purchase your copies. They make fantastic reading this summer um, for all your friends and family as well. Without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to these amazing authors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Julia. That, you she, what me? an amazing library, I have to say, first of all. I love coming here because everybody's such avid readers. It's a beautiful building, and, and we're just all really delighted to be here. You know, not even for this reading, but also there's an amazing photography exhibit going on right as you first walk in by Torrance York, who's here. And I just want to encourage everybody to go and check that out. I mean, there's so much to offer here. And I also want to give a huge shout out to Elm Street Books. They are <laughs> such an important part of our community. And I just want to say, you know, if you've already bought a book, um, they make great gifts, so buy another. <laughs> so thank you. So um, there's a lot going on today. We all just were at another panel book event um, uh, in Greenwich, so we're kind of wired. And on top of that, just two just hours ago, we learned that Julie's book hit the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> and so, which is why have, we have champagne. We have champagne. <laughs> Indulge us. Cheers. Cheers. It's not easy. It's a major, major accomplishment. She's number nine, so she'll be in the print edition in two weeks. And please tell all your friends. It's, it really is it's very exciting. I paid Fiona to say all this. <laughs> she, she's had a very long day waiting, because you find out at around 5 o'clock when your, your agent or your editor calls you. And so you're kind of sitting around trying not to wait for a phone call. It's brutal. I want to start off asking a, a question. I, I'm going to take it from, from your bio, Susie, about ambitious women, that that's what your books are about. And both of your books... One is nonfiction, one is fiction, feature ambitious women. So can you start by just telling us a little about your book? Why don't we start with Susie? Yes. So Anna Bright is hiding, sorry, can we start with Julie? Yeah, let's start with, I, <laughs> um, my book has three ambitious women and actually a lot more in interspersed in different chapters, but um, it focuses on three women who ran um, department stores sort of the during the golden era of fashion and department stores in the um, early to mid uh, 20th century. So I have Hortense who um, ran Bonwit Teller during the Great Depression. It's, it's very unusual. It's a very interesting and complicated story how she became president. She had never had a paying job before she became president of the department store. Um, 
1934, um, and Dorothy Shaver, who became president of Lord and Taylor um, in the in 1945, she actually was um, the highest paid uh, woman that we know of in, in terms of a published salary it, um, during that era. She earned about like almost two million dollars a year in in our money, so it's quite a big deal. Um, and she was really the architect of the American fashion industry. And then um, I have Geraldine Stutz, who ran Bendel's, who, uh, I don't know if you guys remember Henry Bendel's, it's sort of the most recent, in some ways, of the, of the stores. Um, she was in the 1960s and 70s, and she was a really um, important uh, discoverer of many important fashion designers, and um, she did lots of amazing things, too, that you can And read. Susie, how about you? Yeah, thank you for that break. I needed it. Um, Anna Bright is Hiding Something is a ripped from the headlines story set in the fascinating world of female founders. It's inspired by the Elizabeth Holmes story. Some of you might be familiar with her. She was the founder of Theranos, the blood testing system. She's currently incarcerated for fraud. This book is set in Silicon Valley in New York City and features two main characters. The first is Anna Bright. She's the founder of a biotech company valued at $10 billion. She's a media darling, but she's committing fraud and nobody knows it yet. Not her board, not her the media, not her employees. My second main character is Jamie, a business journalist who uncovers the fraud and works via an article to take Anna down, all on the eve of Anna Bright's IPO. So it's a cat and mouse game. It's a story about women in the workplace, ambition, and the true meaning of success. And can you tell us how the inspiration for each book came about? Why don't we Yes, yeah, so I, um, my first book was about the Plaza Hotel. It's sort of a social history of New York City told through the lens of the hotel and my agent was like you should do a book on store wars and I was kind of like mm, I don't know like department stores are amazing but I don't really want to focus on buildings I really want to focus on people so um, it was during COVID and I didn't have a lot to do so I started going down like a research rabbit hole and um, I just found this like fascinating world of these stores that I think a lot of us um, maybe I caught the tail end of it but the, they were these glamorous um, unbelievable places. They were palaces of consumption, but they were also really these female universes that I did not know about. Um, they were places where women could have these amazingly fulsome careers as early as like 1906, um, you know, 1920s. Women were doing these amazing things in these um, in these stores, and then also they were these places, obviously, where women could shop and have pa the power of the wallet. So um, as consumers, they had this power. So it was just this like very fascinating place that did so much for women and I felt like it was so overlooked and I also just loved, you know, these were not the department stores that we think of today. I mean, these were insane places. They had um, dentist offices, they had um, a nursery, you could go drop your children off while you shopped and then got your hair done, you know. Um, in one crazy uh, department store they actually um, had like a publicity thing where they put babies up for adoption. They did totally wild things, um, and it was largely a women's place. I mean, the men, you know, we all know Macy's or Bloomingdale's, and they had their names on the buildings, but it was really the women inside who made these places what they were. And I just um, I got really into it, and then I found these three characters, and I felt like, wow, you know, they really show the scope of the history, and their lives were each so fascinating and different. You fell down the rabbit hole. I did. I fell down the rabbit hole. And, and Susie, you had written historical fiction before this, or two books of historical fiction. And so what made you shift? Where did the inspiration come from? Yeah, so my book that came out in 2020, which was my fourth novel, but my second historical fiction, was set at the 1939 New York World's Fair. And it was a fascinating piece of history. I dropped two ambitious women in that setting and watched them pursue their personal and professional dreams. And so when it came time to think of what my next book about, most likely that I would choose another historical fiction topic. But at that point, which was 2020, I was fascinated by all of the stories of founders that were in the news. I've, I've always been really interested in women who are at the top of their game in the business world. Uh, Ambitious women, women who kind of break all the rules. I've definitely been more of a rule follower in my life, getting uh, better at it now that I've passed 50. But I, I've always been fascinated by women who don't conform to the rules and who 
who kind of almost go the complete opposite direction. And at this time in 2020 and early 2021, there were a lot of stories of women falling from grace in the business world. And this was also around the time that I read Bad Blood, which was the book by John Kerry Rue. I see a lot of people nodding. You're as fascinated by Elizabeth Holmes as I am. Uh, John Kerry Rue broke the story of Elizabeth Holmes fraud. Tyler Schultz, who is George Schultz's grandson, who was the whistleblower, is the one who went to John Kerry Rue. So I read that book, and there was so much, not only about Elizabeth Holmes, but about women in business and what, what they face. And then I started doing a lot of research. I subscribe to this daily newsletter called The Broadsheet by Fortune, and it's fascinating. And every day they curate articles about women in business. And so it was all these inputs coming from all these different directions. And I just thought that that world of female founders, the ecosystem of it, and all of its attendant interests, the interior design, the all, everything that goes around with it, all the statistics about founders, female founders getting 2.4% of the venture capital funding that men get, it just was begging me to write a story about it. And so that's how I decided to choose that topic. Yeah, I mean, I someone was saying on the other panel today that they have to get the first draft out and then so they have something to work with to edit. So I'm a very, I take, I take my time in research and plotting and outlining and then I Oh, was it you, Wendy? <laughs> oh, it was, and then I write really, really fast first drafts, and then I take a lot of time to edit them. So the, the writing of the first draft almost feels like a weight on my shoulders, and I just I put in very, very long days um, to try to get it out of. And what I found really marvelous in reading both of these books is that Julie, you take fact, but you make it read like a work of historical fiction. And in fact, the Wall Street Journal reviewer wrote that she found herself dashing through it like a novel, which is high praise from the Wall Street Journal. And Susie, you brilliantly bring to life this female founder who's inspired by a real life person. And so I'm curious if you can each talk about how you accomplished this accomplished this really interesting mix of fact and fiction. And so you have one nonfiction book that reads like a novel and a work of fiction inspired by fact. How did you pull those together? Um, well, I know for me, there were moments where I have all these friends who write fiction and I was like, oh, maybe I need to rethink this because um, I am very restricted by the materials I can and find, um, you know, if I if I could have made it fiction, I would have had the women meet, for instance. You know, I would have had them the climax where they all met and interacted. Um, and you know, I did feel like they were each talking to each other, like through the eras, and I felt like I was in conversation with them. But you know, that didn't happen. Um, and so, in terms of like trying to put myself in those rooms. I, I tried to do that where I could find the material that allowed me to. So um, it took me like three years to write the book because you know most of that time was actually spent researching um, in like archives and, and interviewing people and finding relatives and all of that. And um, yeah, I, I, I tried to, um, Fiona I, and Susie and all those guys and see how they do that where they put themselves inside the character so I tried to do that much more this time than I've ever done before, um, where if I knew what the room looked like and stuff, I tried to really get more intimate with the women. Um, I also felt really intimate with them because I'd spent so much time with them and I had so much, they, they were like so inspiring to me and I felt a lot of affinity for what they went through. I mean, one of the shocking things for me was how similar what they were experiencing in the 30s or the 40s you know it, it it was no different from what we deal with you know like i i read this article from like 1932 that was called like marriage or career you know and it was exactly as if it could be written today or listening to them talking about you know being the only woman in the room in in a business setting and that kind of thing so um so yeah i don't know i just i that's sort of what i tried to do you I did know. a really good job um, of it. I, it's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it until you asked that question, Fiona. My practice is historical fiction and doing the research because I want so badly to be authentic with the, with the world building. I did that for this book, even though it's, it's set in the present day. And so I did all the research that I would have done for historical fiction on the status of, as I was saying earlier, VC funding, venture capital funding for female founders and challenges that women face in these worlds. I had to learn everything about an IPO, all the different stages of funding. This book is, it sounds like I use a lot of jargon in the book and I definitely am true to the world of 
of a startup. But you don't have to have any experience in those worlds to, to access this book. And then and, the, and journalism too. Yes, I and journalism. And Julie was actually my, when I asked, I, I had this plot point and I really wanted it to work a certain way with my journalist in terms of this source and whether she could use, I'm not, it's a plot point, so I'm not going to give it away. But I called Julie and I asked her, so if you're a journalist, ethically, can you do X, Y, and Z? She's like, no. <laughs> and it just, I was like, oh man, now I have to read work that whole plot point so Sorry. thank you but no thank but it you it felt very authentic thank so you yeah you so I job. so my second main character is a journalist so I wanted to get that world right as well and I have more familiarity with with that world but the other thing was that my founder is an entrepreneur she invented a product so I had to basically invent a product for this book invent several products because I have many characters who are entrepreneurs and I wanted to make sure that they're products, Things, inventions were being depicted properly. So that was a whole other thing, doing research on, and again, I don't want to scare you, this sounds a lot more complicated than it is, but on ocular implants and, and biosensors and lifespans and privacy concerns. So I promise you, it is really accessible. Maybe you guys can back me up on that. But, yes, um, but I did do, I think, as much research as I would have done for one of my historical novels. It flowed beautifully. You really, you integrated it really well. So we felt like we were getting, we were learning something, but it wasn't holding us back. But I also, in terms of, of asking about Elizabeth Holmes, like I, I definitely used her as inspiration, but I did not want this book to be a retelling of the Elizabeth Holmes story. But I do know from my own fascination with the dropout show on Hulu and the inventor, which was the documentary about her and inventing Anna, which some of you may have seen. Um, I took the female, I took the Anna Klumsky character, Vivian Kent, the journalist, as inspiration. People are hungry for more stories like that. And there are a lot of comps in television, comparable titles, but not as many in fiction. And so that's why I really wanted to take that world and give it to people in a book to have a different access point to a story like that. that. And, and Julie, can you talk about your research? Um, because there were no biographies of these three women, right? That nothing had been done before. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's hard about um, women's history, I think, or, or um, people of color, you know, is that in their lifetimes, there wasn't necessarily the recognition that they were important. You know, there might have been news articles and stuff, but there was not that same sense of history or importance, you know, of recording what they'd done. And yeah, none of my three women have ever had biographies written about them. One had published an autobiography, um, like a memoir, but it was kind of a lot of false narratives in it. So it was actually really confusing to deal with because I couldn't tell what was real and what wasn't. But um, so, so I had to, um, you know, I did a lot of um, newspaper searches, um, Lexus, Nexus, that kind of thing. Um, I did um, the the one woman from Bendel's, um, the more recent one, she died in 2005, and many women that worked for her are still alive. So I interviewed, you know, um, I think like 30 or 40 of her former employees that I could get, um, which was wonderful. And I also did, I mentioned genealogists, I... Um, I, uh, I tracked down all the family members, um, living family members. One of them, um, two of them never had children, so it proved a little bit complicated. Um, so I, one of them is uh, Dorothy Shavers from Arkansas, from Mena, Arkansas. So I went to Mena, um, you know, I found relatives, I hired a genealogist. The genealogist found this woman who lived in Maryland, actually, who happened to, her basement was like a repository of all of Dorothy's life. It was amazing because Dorothy was a spinster. She she arrived in New York City in 1919 with her sister. Um, this is before women even had the right to vote. She was from this tiny, tiny railroad town in Arkansas. Um, her and her sister, um, they lived together their entire lives. And her sister was an artist, a really talented, beautiful artist. And she had sort of the business mind. And in 1919, they started a business where Elsie, the sister, made dolls, these like quirky dolls and Dorothy sold them and they actually had a store um, on 47th Street and it's just this amazing thing and she sold them to Lord and Taylor and it eventually helped her get this position and Lord and Taylor in 1924 and then in 1945 she became the president so you can imagine how successful she was but um, but um, Elsie had created all these scrapbooks of their life together of what they what it was like growing up in Mina what it was like to arrive in New York City with a suitcase and no money 
money and no job. Um, so that talking about being more personal, that really gave me an insight. You know, Dorothy's relatively famous. She's the most famous of the women. There is an archive in the Smithsonian of all of her papers. Um, and this stuff had never been discovered before. So that's like the kind of amazing, you know, for a researcher, it's like, wow. So it was like amazing to find all this stuff, um, you know, that no researcher had ever found before. And um, for Hortense, she's from uh, Utah. Um, she grew up like in a pioneer town in Utah, growing her own food, making her own clothing. Um, and her parents were early converts to the Mormon religion. And Mormons are very, very interested in their genealogy. So they kept extensive records. So in St. George, in the, her hometown, there is a pioneer near museum and they had all these records of her family and stuff so I did things like that um, but it was it was not easy <laughs> Was and this is why she is now a New York Times bestselling <laughs> you author. You better just stop. Okay, that's stop. what it takes. <laughs> when you first went into that basement, did you have any idea? And like, I was, I was not like, I drove down to Maryland. She's like, "Come on down." I was like, "Okay," and um, yeah, she was, she was, um, she was so amazingly generous. She is now living in Texas, and we stay in touch. And actually, when my book came out on Tuesday, um, Geraldine's stepdaughter came all the way from London. I interviewed her, and she came all the way. From from London to come to the book party, which was amazing. Um, but yeah, Sally Moss was her, is Dorothy's great grand niece, and she um, she just let me have it. Um, and I was I was looking at these things, you guys, and I was like, this belongs in the Smithsonian. Like it should not be in. So I've actually been in touch with the archivist because I it's like made out of fabrics and stuff, you know, from the preserve it. So. Can I ask Julie a question? Sorry to yeah. take your job, Fiona. But <laughs> so some of you may know, and I know Julie knows, that the New York Times is doing these obituaries of forgotten women whose obituaries hadn't been written. So were any of these women's obituaries written? And if not, are they going to? No, surprisingly, all three of them did have obituaries, which I was sort of like, oh, because I would have pitched them if not for that. But um, no, I mean, Hortense was, you know, in, in she was the first um, president of a, a major Fifth Avenue department store in 1934. So when she died in the 70s, um, the Times did have an obit for her, which I was very um, surprised about, and and it's you know is great. Um, she had been out of the public eye for decades, so it was surprising. Um, Dorothy also did have an obit. Like I said, she was the most famous, so she she you know she was friends with Einstein. She you know had she was very politically involved during the McCarthy era. She was an incredible person, so she was in the conversation enough to have one. And then Geraldine um, died in two thousand and five. And, um, you know, uh, the fashion editor at the Times wrote the obit because she's a big deal in, in like a small fashion, fashion universe. So, And one of the things that both of your books deals with are anti-heroes. In yours, Julie, you have Hortense, who's just a complete study in contradiction in terms of women in power because she is very complicated. And then Susie, you have Anna Bright who is not to be trusted. And so why don't we start with you, Susie. How how do you handle taking someone who is inherently not likable and creating a three-dimensional person? So there's a lot of talk in the book world about unlikable female main characters. And and not everybody likes to read novels with a with an unlikable main character. And I understand that. And so for me, because I was going to make Anna so unlikable, I had to counter her with Jamie, who is my my likable main character. So you had somebody to root for. And it's interesting because a lot of the feedback that I'm getting are people love to hate Anna. You know, like even though they hated Anna while they were reading the story, they couldn't get enough of her. They were like, what horrible thing is Anna going to do next? So it was really fun to write her because I am not like that. And so I got to kind of live vicariously through all the horrible things that she was doing. And it's interesting because I wanted to make her three-dimensional. It was very important to me that you didn't like her, but I needed you to have a little bit of empathy for why she was the way she was. And so another aspect of research that I did was on psychology. And for Anna, it was about being a narcissist. And what are the symptoms of a narcissist? How does somebody become a narcissist? And so I'm not somebody who likes to read a lot of backstory in novels, and I don't like to write a ton of backstory, but there is some backstory on Anna and her mom so that you can get a little bit of sense of why she is the way she is. And so she's she definitely is somebody you you don't like, 
but you can tolerate her through the book because she serves a purpose. And, you know, it is also interesting about the whole likable and unlikable female main character. Novels have to have some conflict, right? So if every character is likable and doing all the right things and making all the right decisions, it'd make for some pretty boring books. So that's why I thought it was fun to include her. I would agree with that assessment of her. I, I love to read for her, so I feel that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Hortense was this really challenging character for me. She, um, so she was present. Bon would tell her, um, her husband actually um, was one of the few men in America who made a ton of money during the Depression. And he was one of the 10 wealthiest men in America. And he owned a company that owned Bon Teller. And she went to work with him in part to keep their marriage together, um, in large part. Um, and actually, in, in my other book, I wrote about Ivana because Ivana was the president of the Plaza Hotel um, while her husband owned it. Um, and it was very much a similar dynamic. I felt like, you know, she really wanted to be close to her husband, um, but her husband was already having an affair, and um, I will go into that later, or you can read the book, but, um, but um, she, eventually really resented work. She felt that her career, she hated being called a career woman, even while she was working. Um, you know, she would portray herself as a hostess, um, hosting a dinner party for her husband and his business associates. That's how she felt, you know, being president of a department store was, even though she was in charge of 1,500 employees and it was a $200 million business in today's money. So it was not a, a small endeavor. Um, she really, really resented her work um, and she also felt like it led to other tragedies, personal tragedies she went through. So she came to despise having a career um, and had a lot of bitterness and that was really complicated and as a modern working woman I had a lot of conflict with that um, and I mentioned her memoir. Her memoir had a lot of sort of a false narrative and so combing through all of that. I wrote it many times, the, her character. Um, and it was interesting. I feel like, you know, it's definitely a story about fashion and the, the department stores, but it's also a history of women's work because each of them sort of had this very different relationship with their careers. You know, Dorothy was, as I said, never married and was very much sort of a male CEO. That's kind of the vibe that she gave off. Um, and she, you know, many examples of that. Um, and, and Geraldine was maybe a bit more of like a modern our modern understanding of what a working woman would be. Um, you know, she didn't shy away from her feminine, you know, her femininity at all. Um, she embraced it and was proud of it. It was sort of the cusp of the women's movement. Um, but it was also, she was also a sizist. Um, she only carried very small sizes in her store. Um, she did not like people who are, you know, n didn't conform to, um, you know, Capote swans. Those were her clients, many of them, you know, um, that whole vibe. So, you know, she had her own kind of internal. Yeah, yet you were able to you know, show them flaws and all, and that's what you both do really well, which makes us makes them accessible to us. Can you talk a little bit about how your book kind of shows how, both of your books show how women's roles have changed over time? Susie, I know you came into the workforce a you couple know. decades ago, and so do you see as you're dealing with this character of Anna Bright, how things have changed over time in terms of women's leadership roles? From You mean from when I started working? Yeah. 100 years ago? No. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think in the last few decades, there probably are more women in leadership positions just because of time. But I think that, at least in my, you know, I was always in marketing and communications. And those were very female dominated, not dominated, but popular career. So I always had a lot of exposure to high level females. Um, I did advertising and promotion in magazines for the first part of my career. And so I think I had a lot of female role models to look up to. And I encountered some really nasty ones too, some nasty women. One woman, when I had a PR internship in college, she literally threw a pen at me. Yeah. She, she threw a pen at me. And then another woman, my first, my second job at Gray Advertising, she screamed at me. So these women were under severe pressure, right? And like, who knows what was going on and what they felt like they needed to prove and, and all that sort of stuff. But I don't really think much has changed in my time. Um, I think definitely in Julie's periods, they've changed. But, 
you know, when I wrote my historical fiction novels, I was really fascinated by the opportunities for women. And the thing that I, was always striking to me was how my books were set in 1939 and 1949, my third book and my fourth book. And I'm not going to remember the numbers right now because book math is hard. And <laughs> But one of my characters was the exact same age, born the same year as Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I always think about that because look what she did. And yes, she was an anomaly. And yes, you know, she was incredible. But like, look at Gloria Steinem, look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg. There were women who were breaking the molds, who were saying, I'm not going to live in that small box that you are expecting me to crawl into. But obviously it was rare. And so I love exploring those challenges that face women who really do not want to follow the rules that have been set out for them by their families and by society. Exactly. And Julie, your book really shows how women's roles in the workforce over time have been cycles. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that was so interesting to me. Actually, my husband pointed that out, and it's really true. Like, in the in the 1920s, you know, women, you think of, like, the flapper, right, in the jazz age. There was a lot of, like, um, w w you know, it's the, this progressive era. So the universities were starting to open up um, to women. They were offering social work courses, nursing, things like that. There were a lot more opportunities. The flapper was very like sexually uninhibited, financially independent. It was a very different vibe. Then in the 1930s, in the Depression, it was really shocking to me to learn some of this. You know, um, there were actually marriage laws that required federal rules that required businesses fire women who were married because the concept the idea was that you know you have a man to take care of you it's a depression they deserve the jobs and you do not and um, they were forced out of the workforce and a lot of the gains that had been made in the 20s were lost in the 30s and actually it wasn't true many of the women statistically were sole breadwinners so it was very challenging um, and then in the 40s you had you know the war and the draft and all of a sudden you you know, Rosie the Riveter, and all the women got to go back into the workforce and take these jobs of men who were, you know, fighting during the war. And then, of course, the 1950s is like the Leave it to Beaver era, right? So you kept going like back and forth. Back, They were like little inches, I feel like, women made. But, but then I felt like, you know, once the sort of modern women's movement in the 60s and stuff kind of took place, then we started to have much more established change. Um, but it's interesting to me because this is the fashion industry they were in and we don't often think of that as being you know like a, a very male dominated um, area and actually it wasn't I mean I think that it, it should I should say that even through all those years the women who were working in these stores were making huge impacts in an industry and affecting all these jobs I mean the garment industry all of that you know partly the women working in the department stores were creating demand for for that industry and it was you know they were doing a lot to to create change things. So while there and were... Susie, I understand you enlisted your sons to help figure you. out what this company that Anna Bright runs should be. Can you... Well, they actually... That one, they didn't. And and in fact, I my first product was a home, smart home automation system, which was so boring. And my agent said, you need to change this. It's not going to sell any books. So I did change that. But but I, my, I have three boys, 23, 21, and 19. And when they were younger, they loved Shark Tank. So they used to come up with business ideas. And I put a couple of them into the book, including one which is called My Gum, capital M, lowercase i, capital G U M. And what it was was a pack of gum that would be called like ice cream sundae. So instead of each stick having the same flavor, there'd be like for chocolate ice cream, for vanilla ice cream, for strawberry, and then sprinkles. And and so you can make your own, you could make your own gum experience. So they were very excited. Two of them have read the book through, um, and they were very excited to see their invention in the book. But they did help me in my last, in, in We Came Here to Shine, my World's Fair book, they did help me one of the climactic parts where something really bad happens. We did that over dinner one night, so that was fun. And Julie, you know, one of the things in your book we realized These that department stores that she's describing are so different from the ones that we know today, few that are left. And can you tell us about 
perhaps the ugly duckling makeover? Oh, yeah. I know. I got a lot of heat for this online, so I don't really? know. I feel like really? people, because people thought I did it. I was no. like, no, no, this is no. not me. Um, yeah, one of the, this, so they had all these crazy publicity things. So one of them was an ugly duckling contest where essentially they asked women to write essays about how ugly they were. And they picked the ugliest woman um, and they brought her to New York. And the department store gave her an entire new wardrobe, a new hairdo. They even um, had a plastic surgeon give her a nose job. Um, and then they had this like big reveal where, you know, she came on stage, people bought tickets. It was um, it was in conjunction with, I think, Mademoiselle magazine. So they were like sort of her whole journey was, you know, being recorded in the newspapers and in the magazines. And then they did this big reveal. Um, her name was, um, she, she changed her name from Callie Foots to Karen Faust. Um, she like, you know, reappeared as this beauty and they had these before and after pictures. Um, and yeah, she had a totally new nose. I don't know, it was very crazy. But, um, you know, it got, they, they did all these kind of crazy publicity things. They also, um, another store like wrote a book, um, a novel about a young woman who wanted a job in a department store. And it was sort of um, advice and, and sort of a story about what it was like to work at a department store. And and but um, it was uh, they even created like a clothing uh, uh, a clothing line for young women hoping to go into the workforce based on the book. It was a Polly Tucker. It was like actually a best selling book. Um, and then there was a Polly Tucker clothing line, and they even used proceeds from the clothes to like create a scholarship. So it was a whole thing. It was like they did all these crazy things. There's so much in your book that know. just makes your jaw drop. Yeah. When, when you compare it to how things are today, it, it mm. really shows us. I want to ask both of you, you're part of a group called the June 4th Authors. Can you tell us about what that is and how that came to be? So the June 4th Authors is, I think there are seven of us who all published last Tuesday on June 4th. And what happened is a couple of us realized we were publishing on the same day back in December um, when we started promoting early sales, you know, pre-launch sales, pre-orders. And I think I reached out to Annabelle Monahan and I said, wait, you're publishing on June 4th? I'm publishing on June 4th. And then we found out Julie was June 4th and Brooke Lee Foster published on June 4th, All the Summers in Between. Jane L. Rosen just came out with Seven Summer Weekends. Chelsea Devantes came out also, I Shouldn't Be Telling You This. It's the name of the book. And <laughs> Olivia Mentor, it's spelled Munter, but it's pronounced Mentor. Her book is called Such a Bad Influence. And so it was really, we, we, we got on a Zoom and we thought, how can we make the most of this because people expect women or people coming out with a product, any product on the same day to compete with each other, right? Well, if you buy my product, I only want you to buy my product. I don't want you to buy her product. But instead of that, we decided, well, there's more power in numbers. And so we decided to do a couple things. We decided to promote each other on social media. We did some contests, we did some countdowns, and we all posted it so that people who follow Julie can all of a sudden know about my book and vice versa. And we've done a lot of press hits together, um, and, and we keep mentioning each, each other on all of these different opportunities that we have. And then the best part of it was we had a group text, which is still, and today it was filled with congratulations to Annabelle, who won, who got on the USA Today and Washington Post list, and to Julie, and it's just been a wonderful group therapy opportunity for us to really help each other and, and form community and support in what is a very stressful and overwhelming and exciting period in all of our lives. And, and it was fun, because on Instagram they post all the time, and you could see that they were you know, building up to this big day. It was, it was just terrific. And I have to say, the authors of, of fiction who are in this area and live in this area, have there's so many of us that have, we've, we've become such good friends. There's some in the audience. It's, it's just a, a really wonderful thing. If you want to change careers, go ahead <laughs> yeah. and do this. Come join we us. welcome no. you. Because we all had other careers before we did this. We truly appreciate, you know, any kind of success. If it's, you know, what, whatever it is, getting a book published, getting an agent, it's something to be really celebrated. And, and we do, clearly, with all the champagne. Um, I'm going to open it up to a Q&A, but I have one last question for you guys, so start thinking about your questions. What do you want readers to take away? I mean, for me, I felt like a lot of responsibility telling these women's stories just because you'd never hear of them if I hadn't their stories. So I, I really, and they were, you know, they were really complex 
interesting women. I really hope that you guys feel that same kind of awe of like what they did and how we've benefited from what they've done. And also just understanding how, you know, the clothing we wear, how it came to be. I mean, that was really fascinating for me too. Just the history of fashion in America was fascinating. I don't know. And um, yeah, just kind of the like long timeline of it all. I thought, you know, oh yeah, like the 60s and 70s, but I didn't think like 1910. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it was amazing, that, that longevity of... I want people to be exposed to this world in a new way, through a new access point. Um, I want people to have an escape, because for me, I find reading to be one of my favorite things to do to get out of my brain, um, and also to learn something. And I think from both of these books that even though one's nonfiction and one's fiction, you're still gonna take something away from it in terms of new a new point of knowledge. And then for the most important thing is I want people to find it a fun read where they're turning the pages and they cannot wait to get back to it. Yeah, I wanna amend my answer actually. <laughs> um, I, cause I feel that way. I feel that like people think nonfiction and they think like, oh, it's so fuddy duddy or like heavy, you know? And I really, I also want it to be really fun. Like it's not a head, I mean, yeah, I hope you learn things, but like it's definitely, I, I feel like so much nonfiction can be so serious and it really should be fun. I mean, you should enjoy it. I agree. Like reading it should be fun. So um, I hope it's not like heavy. You know, it's it doesn't feel like medicine. It should feel like candy. You know, that's kind of a couple of beach reads is exactly. what we're talking about. Yes. Yeah, summer romance. So yeah, if there's any questions from anyone about the books or the writing process, we do have a mic that can be passed around. I was just wondering, um, both in retail and as founders, a lot of women can't do that and have a family. So I was wondering. Yeah. Julie, were any, I know one was a spinster, one was trying to keep her marriage together. Geraldine, I'm not sure. Were any of them trying to juggle work and raising a family? Because in those times, men were not stay-at-home dads. Yeah. And I was wondering with you, um, Susie, whether or not your protagonist was also married and trying to raise the children. Because I think that Elizabeth Holmes had a baby in prison, which is a great time to have a baby because you're not doing anything else. <laughs> well, she showed up to her trial pregnant, <laughs> yeah. which a lot of people thought was a ploy. Who knows whether it was. And then, yes, she did go to prison pregnant, so which is a whole thing. But no, in my story, Anna Bright is, does not have a family. Um, and neither does, and Anna's in her early 30s and Jamie is in her late 20s. So no, it wasn't an issue for them. Yeah, um, Hortense had two sons um, and it was it was really challenging. And she, she, um, she talks about it a little bit in different interviews that I found and a bit in her, bio, in her autobiography. Um, um, but it was, it was definitely not easy and neither son ended up successful in life. And so, um, I, again, she sort of, I think, I think there obviously was not a lot of support. Um, and the other two women, yeah, Dorothy never, um, I couldn't uncover any, um, romantic relationships actually in the book. Um, and I talk about that a little bit. And with Geraldine, she was married. Um, she had a very intense love affair, but it ended in divorce and she had had cancer and couldn't have children. So, um, you know, uh, I think that's such an interesting point that you make because in Julie's, the time period you couldn't be successful and have children, no. right? And and I have a quote. I think Dorothy said, "Like I, I'd much rather have a, I I'd it. much rather have a career than a humdrum married life, or something like that." Is so I think she definitely made a decision um, not to have a family because she was so ambitious, um, and that really wouldn't have been possible. And I think I mentioned like an article from 1932. There was one from like the 20s in I think it was Good Housekeeping, and it was about um, could you. Have have a job and have children and how would that I'm work? I'm just looking at these beautiful covers and you both found such amazing photographs. Was it a long process? Can you talk about how the covers came to be? Yeah, I'll start. So so typically it works differently with every publisher, but the publishers that I've worked with ask you for what they call a cover brief. And you are meant to write a synopsis of your book, some comparable titles, some covers, treatments that you kind of like. You don't get, you don't get to 
tell them exactly how you want the cover to be, but typically cover designers don't read the books because they just don't have time to do all that. And that's probably different for depending on the designer and depending upon the publisher. But my publisher, the cover designer, clearly did not read the book because the first round that I got back, and I was very specific in my cover brief. To give a shout out to cover designers, you know, they have a challenge in front of them in that they have to make the cover look appealing, but it also serves a huge purpose. There's a science to it in terms of it has, the reader, the potential reader, has to know what the genre is by looking at the cover. It has to fit into the, for bookstores, I mean, Eve could probably talk about this, but you know, the bookstores, there used to be a woman at Barnes and Noble corporate who had a lot of say in all of the book covers. And, and if she didn't like a particular cover, the designers would redesign it because she would say, this won't sell, I can't sell this book. So my first round of covers came back very thriller, very femme fatale. And my book, though it has suspenseful elements to it, it is not, it is not um, at the thriller genre in terms of all the conventions and tropes that thriller authors have to follow. So I did what you're not supposed to do, which is went on Canva and designed some suggestions. She's really good on Canva. She is. She's she, talented. She I designed my last graphic. cover too, so I was kind of influenced by the fact that my last cover I designed and they used it and so I thought well you know what I'm going to be very specific about what I think and I was very very careful in my email back to say I am not a cover designer these are very very rough this is just concepts in how I see this and I gave a lot of options and I made them very rough because I didn't want them to think I was trying to design the cover and they used they came back with another round that was even the publisher was like, these are all horrible. I think we're going to go with your idea. So um, this is a stock photo that they actually, the publisher found, but they used the treatment of putting the paint. You can't really see it. It's very pale, but there's pink paint over her face. Yeah, so I had a, a different cover originally. Um, they, the cover designer, I guess they asked a pretty famous illustrator. He creates a lot of illustrations for like Dior and stuff. He's a fashion illustrator. Um, he does these beautiful washes and it was like sort of this very sex in the city, um, a shopping bag and like heels, you know, like, a, like legs and heels. It was very sexy. I loved it. Um, they presented it to the sales force and the sales force said, absolutely not. Like, no way, that cover is no. So they nixed it um, and said, because it read like fiction, and it is nonfiction. So, um, like you were saying, Susie, like, it needs to present what it is. It needs to fit um, on the on the shelf. Um, you know, I'm going to go on a nonfiction or history shelf. It can't look like a romance novel, you know? So, um, so then they came back with this, and I was given um, peach or blue. That was my, that was my you you texted me. You I texted went, me. I went for Peach. Yeah. With the two covers. I was like pretty upset just because yeah. it was a hard transition and I was sort of, I loved, you know, your first love. I don't know. I, I saw the first thing. I now very much like my, my book cover and I'm very glad it's this because I, I think it is it is nonfiction. It should look nonfiction. Um, it is a, a photo. They, they couldn't get the rights to the woman, to that image actually. So they kind of like, so then that was that. That, that was happened, happened to you too with the, with the, the image of the spectacular paperback, right? Yeah, I had to be very careful because Radio City is very proprietary. And so I couldn't have the full, where you can see it's kind of broken up. So that's how they, that was our tweak of the nose. The picture of the woman on the paperback, isn't she, wasn't there an that's issue different. with getting the rights to her? Yeah, the paperback comes out in July and they um, they wanted to change it so it was a person on the cover and we found this beautiful model and she, she was, you know, this wasp waist and standing with the backdrop of the city behind her, it was perfect. And uh, but she she was a very famous model, and it, but but they found a, a great yeah. a great. I was going to say it's a beautiful Luckily, cover. There's, there's a lot yeah. of great '50s images out there to, to take from. Anyone else with uh, questions? Um, for all three of you, it sounds like you did other things before you decided to go. And um, 
how many workshops or things did you do before you went into writing? And then how many other books did you write that were not accepted? Or how much rejection did you have to go through before I, you? I worked in marketing and communications for the first part of my career, working for advertising agencies, nonprofits, magazines, and internet companies. Um, then I had three kids and started writing freelance and decided, well, my next challenge, maybe I'll write a novel. And so I approached that the way that I approach most things, which is by studying for it. So I took a course, which the funny story is, and some of you will be like, ah, oh, my first course was taught by Kristen Harmel, who is a very, <laughs> very famous and popular fiction writer. But she gave me a really great introduction through that course to some of the tactics of how to write fiction, the practice practice of how to write fiction, and the accountability for, for starting my first book. I have dealt with a lot of rejection in my career, and I think that most authors have. The ones who haven't probably will at some point. It's a really, really hard thing. I've had a lot of high highs and a lot of really low lows that these two ladies know intimately about, not about themselves, but about me, um, which is where the whole part of support comes in. So I couldn't get an agent for my first book. I queried for about a year. And so I ended up working with a small hybrid publisher for my first two books and then got an agent and a publisher for my third book. But I've definitely um, experienced a lot of rejection. And it's really, really hard. And it's also hard for authors to talk about publicly because we don't want it to affect our future your sales. So, um, but when you start hearing people open up about it, you realize that everybody's got a book on the shelf. Everybody has had a lot of rejection from agents or editors and it's just, it's challenging. What is Liz and Lisa's podcast? Yeah, so they have, so Liz and Lisa yeah. are authors, um, Liz Fenton and Lisa Steinke, and their their podcast is called We Fight So You Don't Have To, but they do a series called The Struggle Bus, and it's really, really good, because they have very well-known authors coming on and talking about a lot of rejections, and, and it's it was so reaffirming for me, because I was like, oh my gosh, that person who I have in such high regard has dealt with some of these things also. Yeah, I, mine's a little different just because I'm a journalist, so I, I came through it differently. I um, I was just like a regular newspaper reporter. Um, then I'm, I'm old, so the uh, so internet old. kind of destroyed our business. I was the business editor. I was the first business editor of the Huffington Post, um, and that was not journalism the way I knew journalism, so I was not really interested in like aggregating news. So I started freelancing. I started freelancing for the Times very regularly. And then I wrote, I was writing like features for them. And some of my features, you know, like whatever did very well. And, and I got um, some people asked me, some agents contacted me. And that's how I ended up writing my first book um, that way. I think it's a little different from nonfiction than fiction. We don't typically like query agents and right. stuff, journalists. Um, so it's like a different process a little bit. Um, but I definitely have had rejection. Um, the book between my first and my second, um, you know, I, I went out with a proposal that didn't go anywhere. Uh, no one wanted to read a nonfiction book about tampons. Yeah, it's so different. Nonfiction, you don't have to write the book. You can write a proposal and then you get the contract to write the book. Fiction, you have to write the whole book. So you're committed. And my journey was kind of circuitous. I started as an actress in New York City for about 10 years, went to Columbia Journalism School. With my husband. As, yes. So and, crazy. And started, uh, you know, doing journalism, but not like Julie journalism. It was heartburn articles. Um, so a little different. And, uh, and then at a certain point, I just had an idea for a story set at the Barbizon Hotel for Women. And I was able to get an agent, I think because the idea was so good. But the book was not. And it needed so much work. And so I really kind of lucked in where she loved the concept. But she said to me, we're going to overhaul this whole thing. And we did. So I, I kind of slid in under the wire with a, a good pitch. That's the book, The Dollhouse, which is really yeah. wonderful. Well, I just want to say thank you um, to the library for having us. Thank, thank you to you. Eve for coming out and selling books. Thank you for coming here and buying books. We <laughs> truly appreciate it. And also thank you to Julie and Susie. This has just been such Thanks, a marvel. And, and there's so much commonality between your two books, even though they're so different. It's true. And it's really fun. I feel like I'm back in school of compare and contrast. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. thank you. Thank you all for coming and thank you for speaking. It was really educational.